about the, the, the second Chandrasekhar lecture today on amorphous solids. Uh, the lecture is also being broadcast in our secondary seminar room. Okay. I hope you guys can hear me there. Okay. Okay. So Thank you, Sir so Thank you very much. Okay. Very much. Again, since, since uh, these are uh, Chandrasekhar lectures, let me tell you about my last meeting with uh, Chandrasekhar. Uh, <coughs> it was sort of um, by chance, I wanted to talk to him about some experiment that I didn't quite understand. I wanted to get, hear his view. So I knocked on his door and I entered in. And I started to tell him about what bothered me. And I saw that he was not quite uh, listening. So I said, well, Professor Chandrasekhar, if it's not a good day for you, I can come another day. He said, no, 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 please sit down. I want to tell you something. And he said, today I'm 80 years old. And I sent today my last paper to a philosophical magazine. I'm not going to write any paper anymore. I said, Professor Chandrasekhar, yeah, you're so good. No, 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 don't, don't, don't. And he said, for the rest of my life, I want to understand how Newton thought. Because whenever I take a Principia, I open it up, I see a theorem, I try to prove it. It takes me some three days. I come up with some ugly algebraic uh, proof, and then I open it up, and I'm shocked by some beautiful geometric idea that he could prove it like this. I need to understand how this works. And indeed, for the rest of his life, he was translating Principia into English. There's a very beautiful book. I don't know if you all read it, but it's very nice, of Chandrasekhar on Principia. <coughs> it's not his, maybe his most original book, but it's very beautiful in the sense that he really tried to give a taste of how Newton was actually thinking. So I was very touched by this, you know, a person of his greatness saying, that's it. I mean, I don't want to do any more science. I just want to understand how Newton thought. Um, another person in Chicago who uh, had a big uh, influence on me personally is Leo Kadanov. Uh, when I started to work with Leo, he would scream on me every second or third days, you chemist, because I did my degree in theoretical chemistry. You chemist, you are trying to say vague things about very big problems. We physicists, we want to say very precise things on very well-defined problems. And actually, it's, it's a good remark. You know, I was sitting today in some of the lectures and we we're trying to say maybe some too much about huge problems. And what I'm trying to do today, I'll try to show you that I'm trying to do something very, very precise on, on something very well defined. So uh, let me just give a background. I'm glad that Spenta is here because he's the only one who didn't see uh, these plots yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he gives a good excuse. <laughs> very good that you came, Spenta. I really thank you. Now we can do whatever I want, show the same things again and again. So this is a typical uh, phase diagram for a material which at high temperatures is a liquid. This is a, a specific volume. And <coughs> when you decrease the temperature, specific volume for the liquid goes uh, quite rapidly down. Then there is a phase transition somewhere. But if you go slowly, you would crystallize. And then the gradient of specific the specific volume versus temperature of, of the, the crystal is smaller than for the liquid. But if you quench, let's say, if you go very quickly, you would go into what we call a supercooled liquid, which is thermodynamically unstable. Let's say the stable thermodynamic state is, of course, the crystal, but it exists. And there are many, many such examples that are good. Um, there are good glass formers like glycerol, where whatever you do here, you get to the supercooled state very easily. There are very bad glass formers like metals who have a very strong tendency uh, to crystallize. But even for metals, there are metallic glasses that we're going to discuss soon that you get by either very quick quench or by combining a few metals together to confuse the, the crystal, and then you get this uh, super cool liquid. Then you, when you continue to uh, cool down, um, at some point, the relaxation time, I mean, as you go down, the system becomes slower and slower. Relaxation time is increasing very rapidly, and we've seen these things. So you can go as a function of one over the temperature, some 12, 13, 14 orders of magnitude in the measured viscosity. And indeed, um, when you do this at some point, uh, the 
patience of the experimentalist uh, goes over, why people call the glass transition when the uh, viscosity is 10 to the 13, because then it takes a day to pour the liquid from a beaker, and no experimentalist has more patience than one day. So this is called the glass transition. Of course, it's meaningless in the sense that it could wait longer, and you can see still a uh, sort of um, slower behavior, but at some point, the system uh, would relax so slowly that it acts effectively as a solid. And of course, what's the difference between a solid and a liquid? We all know you put an external strain on a fluid, it flows. You put an external strain on a solid and it will resist. It will have a plus a elastic re re response. The internal stress will grow. And this happens here for what we call a glass. So we all know that the glass is very different from the crystal in the sense that it's disordered. I'm going to go back to, to this. So what I'm going to make clear from the beginning that in this lecture, I'm going to be here. We heard a lot over the last days about the glass transition. I'm not going to talk about the glass transition. So I want to understand something about the properties of the amorphous solids in the uh, solid regime. Uh, you also have to realize, of course, that this is in some sense in the eyes of the beholder, because what is the glass that you get depends on the protocol. So this is not a sharply defined transition in the sense that, e that if you go faster, you go first to a solid uh, behavior. If you go slower, you, you go deeper. So the quench rate is very important. Properties depend on the quench rate, etc. But I'm going to come back to this later. What I want to show you now is a very nice experiment uh, that introduces the notion of a metallic glass. Now, as I said, in general, metals prefer to crystallize. So in order to make a metallic glass, uh, which people have already known for years, is either to quench them very rapidly. So in the 1960s already, people were making metallic glasses by quenching at a rate of 10 to the 6 Kelvin per second. And the best way was to uh, to uh, take a sort of molten uh, binary mixture of glass and spray it on a cold substrate, so you get a very fast cooling, but this way you could go get only films of metallic glass or ribbons. What Bill Johnson has done in Caltech, which is a simple but ingenious idea, is to take uh, more than two, like four, five, even six different metals, mix them together, and then you could get a, a glassy state by cooling it even 10, second, 10 square Kelvin per second, and okay. So now I'm going to show you an experiment in which we're going to throw a metal ball over in three tubes, where the bottom is either, t either titanium or steel or metallic glass, and see what is going to happen here. So these are the three tubes, and we're going to throw uh, this has the stainless steel at the bottom, this is titanium, this is metallic glass, what Bill Johnson called liquid metal, because that's the name of his company that makes a lot of money, by the way. We threw a ball from upstairs, here it jumped up to here on the steel, here up to here, and here it went out of the, the, the tube. The restitution coefficient of the metallic glass is much larger than either steel or titanium. Now we threw them from the same height. You see on the steel, it is jumping, and in a short while it's gonna stop. Here on the titanium, it's almost going to stop. On the metallic glass, the same ball continues to go up and down, 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 up and down. Actually, the main reason for the decay now is the friction with the air. The restitution coefficient is almost one. In stainless steel, restitution coefficient is 0.6. In titanium, is about 0.8. Here, it's almost one, okay? So now you want to ask why. Still, it still goes on. I don't want to, to borrow you, but it'll go for a while. Actually, it's very nice to listen to the change in frequency. It'll be Anyway, we'll continue. So you may know that Tiger Wood used a golf club made of Bill Johnson metallic glass. This is one of his secrets. Uh, now he's no longer using it, and he's no longer world champion. So I mean, that was very useful for him. And, and actually, the reason he doesn't use it is because of a problem we're going to talk about. It actually breaks. And it's one of the issues about metallic glasses, which I'm going to come back to. So why crystalline metals have a small uh, restitution coefficient compared to metallic glass? Well, we all know. 
I mean, you cannot make a bulk metal without having dislocations. Entropy at any temperature will make dislocations. Okay? I mean, you can make it perfect. In a thermodynamic limit, never perfect. And what dislocations do when you strain or when you stress, when you bang on this thing, they glide. Okay, this is what a question was this morning. What is gliding? These are gliding. These are the dislocations that under strain will glide. They will move. They have some velocity. And that is an irreversible motion. It will take out energy, for example, from the ball that is banging on it. And therefore, the resolution coefficient is small. On the other hand, a glass is a mess. It has no long-range order. Uh, it's... There are no dislocations because you cannot define a dislocation because there's no long range order with respect to which you can define a, a dislocation. So you don't have this. So they're very strong, they're very springy, they have a very high restitution coefficient because of that reason. Nevertheless, uh, they have a problem that I'm going to show you next. Now, why do we care so much about metallic glasses? Well, uh, one of the reasons, of course, is exactly this, you know, so the ball maybe is a game, but in the same way, a metallic glass is very soft to the, swi to the switch of a magnetic field, right? In a metal, again, when you switch a magnetic field, dislocations move back and forth and take energy out. Now, where do you switch a magnetic field 50 or 60 times a second, depending on the cycle? In transformers, okay? So, indeed, when you have transformers, uh, they are made today from a metal, and you switch magnetic field there 60 times per second, 50 times per second, and energy is lost. If you compute what you could use or what you could save, uh, if you replace the crystal metal in the core of, of transformers with uh, metallic glasses, uh, core losses can be 70 to 80 percent lower, uh, less CO2 emissions. I did a back of, of an envelope uh, calculation for China and India, and I concluded that you could save about 25 to 30 terawatt hour annually. So this would be, this would be a reduction of CO2 emission by 20 to 30 million tons. It's, it's significant. I mean, something that one may want to have. The fly in the ointment is this. So these materials, which are so springy and have such nice uh, uh, soft response to magnetism and such good response mechanically have a tendency to break. And they break in what we call a shear band. So this is the phenomenon, the phenomenon of a shear band. This is a small rod of metallic glass which is pressed this way. So you compress it. And even though you have a strain which is distributed uniformly over the whole sample, it has a tendency to concentrate all the strain on a thin layer. And then this thin layer is roughly at 45 degrees with the external strain. Uh, I show you this 45 is not always uh, 45. It's to first order approximation about 45 degrees. And all the stress, all the strain is concentrated in the thin layer and then the system there breaks. This is, this is going to be the phenomenon that we want to actually understand. And of course, understanding with the hope in general that we can uh, delay it or avoid it in order to make these uh, materials more readily available for technological applications, which are coming to it. anyway. You may or may not know, but uh, Bill Johnson is now uh, financing his lab and himself on the patents that he sold to iPhone. The iPhone cases are the new ones are going to be made and are already being made by metallic glass. And the reason is that it's a glass. When you warm it up, you can me it melts and you can feel a mold. And when it cools down, you don't need to, uh, to sort of work. You don't need to, to work it because there are no spitzes, no, there are no corners, right? Because it's a glass that is actually getting, so it's getting a lot of money from iPhone. Anyway, um, as I said, the angle, okay, so here are two examples of a, a glassy material they're going to describe soon, a glassy material that is really binary, as most of these glasses that we looked at in the last couple of days, that are uh, compressed or are being uh, pulled. So it's uniaxial compression and pulling. And as you see, the angle is not 45 here, it's either 54 in this case to the axis and is about 46 here. 
um, the strain value that you get uh, where this begins is 5.8% in this case, 5.1% in this case. I would like to understand these angles and I would like to understand these numbers. So I want to actually uh, propose to you a theory that will come up with hard numbers like why these angles differ, why these values of the strain where it happens uh, differ. If you look at all the literature and you look at angles of uh, shear bands uh, from all materials that exist, it's between 30 and 60 degrees. And we like to understand what is this limit? Why 30 and 60? Why not 25? It's very sharp, between 30 and 60, and I'll give you a theory that will explain this. Are these rods of the same dimension? Sorry? Are these rods of the same dimension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, these are the same starting material, one on the compression. Sorry? Same diameter? No, no, no. This is a, 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 a binary glass of uh, Leonard Jonesians with, with two. Pulling it from above? No, I'm pushing it either this way or pulling it this way. So the principal axis of the strain is along here. It's uniaxial this way, either pulling or pushing. Ah, is the angle? No. The angle is going to be determined by internal reasons. And I am going to show you why, how the angle is going to be chosen with respect to the principal uh, axis of the, of the stress. It's not a cylinder, it's a two-dimensional two uh, two -dimensional thing. You know, I'm going to show also in three dimensions also is, is occurring. So this is just as a demonstration for the fact the angle varies. And I'm saying in two dimensions and three dimensions, the range that you see in the literature between 30 and 60 degrees. Say it again. 31 and 59, I've seen, but not 60, no 30, okay, but in that range. Then don't speak about friction. About friction? I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking about uh, friction, I say the results in the literature for shear bending are between 30 and 60. I don't want the ah, maybe with, uh, ah, really? Yeah. I, I have to, to see this because my theory doesn't <laughs> allow it. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to check. Okay, so what we need to do first is uh, talk about the difference between the crystalline versus glassy response to stress in order to understand what is, is going on. So if you have a crystal, especially the point symmetry, and you put a little strain, that's going to be it, right? Because when you strain, some bones are going to extend, some bones are going to shorter, but the mechanical equilibrium of each particle when you have point symmetry is not going to change. This is not the case in a glass. In a glass, if you do such a simple affine transformation, as we call it, as I'm going to introduce in a moment, the system responds in a complicated way, and you get a mess. So clearly, statistical methods, nonlinear methods, are called for discussing what is going on. So what is plasticity in amorphous solids? So this is a slide that I'm using already uh, many times. I think it's very useful, because in one slide, you understand something very deep. So please be with me. Um, so, we need to say, or, or we need to differentiate between affine and non-affine. So, I'm going to call affine a transformation that I'm making on the positions of the particles. So, have uh, particles. Uh, by the way, in all the talk, all my examples are going to be binary glasses. Leonard Jones, point particles with two different sigmas, with two different lengths. Um, so, the particles are in positions xi. J is going to be some externally chosen transformation, say simple shear. So um, simple shear is simply going to take the system from here to here, okay, with the particles making these motions. This guy came from here to here, etc. And this is an affine transformation. Now, as I said, in a crystalline solid, that's going to be all. So here is an example of a binary such mixture. And what I'm going to do first is the FI transformation is going to be a simple shear. Let's say I'm going now to move it such that the amount of motion is uh, determined by these 
arrows here. So the largest arrows upstairs, zero arrows here, and this is linear in y. If this is x and this is y, this is going to be a simple shear linear in y. So I did it. Okay, let me go back. This is the original system. I just did it. Now I'm asking, are the forces between the particles, or are the forces on every particle zero? Is the system in mechanical equilibrium? It was in mechanical equilibrium before. So this is how I made it. Now I did the affine transformation. Let's look at all the forces. A big mess. So these are the forces now on the particles, and they are not zero. So the system is no longer in mechanical equilibrium. So I need to do another, what we call non-affine transformation, that I'm going to define by UI, in order to bring the system back to mechanical equilibrium. So, whoop, that was it. Okay, so this was the system. Now I energy minimized, I brought the system back to mechanical equilibrium, and I can do it now again. This process of making an affine transformation and doing a energy minimization is known as a thermal quasi-static straining. And I'm going to stay almost to the end with a thermal quasi-static. At the end, I'll say something about the effect of temperature. So I want to say something very precise. A thermal quasi-static is the cleanest strain that you can put on a system. It does depend on temperature, it does depend on rate of straining, and then you can say things that are very, very precise. So, for example, you can say that I started with the system in mechanical equilibrium, and after a small step j, I ended up again in the system of mechanical equilibrium. So the forces, so if I now parameterize this j by some parameter gamma, that is usually call, called the, the strain, which in this case is the ratio of this length and this length, so this gamma is the parameter that characterizes this j, then d f i d gamma is zero. I started with uh, zero forces and ended up with zero forces. But the force f i, of course, is nothing but minus the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian u of all the system, d r i. This is the force on the particle i. So I now have a interesting second derivative, one, uh, one full, one partial, that I need to understand. Now, of course, now the relationship between the uh, position xi and the non-affine response ui is linear here. So whether I do it du dri or du dui to that order is the same. So I could either look at this condition or that condition. But this is the condition that I started and ended with mechanical equilibrium. Let us now interpret this condition. So firstly, of course, I have one obvious contribution. There's going to be the second partial derivative d squared u d gamma dy, that's an obvious uh, contribution. And then there is a more subtle contribution saying that how much non-affine uh, uh, response I'll have also will depend on gamma. So I have a chain rule here in the du dui, so I now have to write this as d squared u dy duj, duj d gamma, because uj itself is a function of gamma. Now that's very nice, because what did I now discover in this condition? This matrix, d squared duj dui, is a well-known matrix, known as the Hessian matrix Hij. This object has only one index, so it's a vector. We call it psi i, and this is known somewhere in the literature as the non-affine force. And now I have a formal equation for how much uh, duj, d gamma, I have. If I could now invert this equation, if I could invert h, if this matrix doesn't have zero eigenvalues, I can invert h and find what is the non-affine thing. So I can begin to understand what are the processes that are occurring once I have decided to do an affine transformation, and I, I'm, I'm looking at the non-affine re response, and I want to sort of understand what it does. So if I assume that this h has no zero eigenvalue, I can, of course, invert. Now, this assumption is dangerous. And the danger is that I'm going to see, you all know, that there are going to be values of gamma where eigenvalues of h are going to zero, and then this is going to be an instability and what we call a plastic event. So plastic events are going to be understood as uh, eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix going through zero. So how does it look? Well, here is an example for a system on the machine. These are the leading eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix as a function of the relative strain gamma. And as you see, there are some eigenvalues that care very little. 
you change gamma, well, they do have some dependence, but nothing really, really dramatic. But here is one that cares a lot. This is an eigenvalue that starts at a finite value, and as a function of gamma, and the value of gamma p, bingo, goes to zero, and a new phenomenon is occurring. Now, it turns out that uh, there is a very simple theory for this going to tau to zero. What happens is the system goes through a saddle node bifurcation. Saddle node bifurcation is the phenomenon that in some energy landscape you are residing in a, in a minimum, and at some point now the energy landscape is going to change and you are, you are coming close to a saddle. At some point you have a saddle and you're going to go to a new minimum. So this is an irreversible event and generically saddle node uh, bifurcations always are, are characterized by a square root uh, singularity which is very, very easy to prove. I'm not going to prove it now but you know everybody knows this. So the way that the eigenvalue goes to zero is always as a square root of the value gamma p minus gamma where we're still here. Now, as long as this didn't happen, as long as this didn't happen, even when I'm here, when the eigenvalue is small, I can invert the equation that I had before, and I can write an equation for the non-affine change dui d gamma. So it's going to be the inverse of h on the non-affine force. And now if I take the non-affine force and I expand it in the eigenfunction of h, you know that the eigenvalues of h minus 1 is 1 over the eigenvalues of h. So I get now an expansion of psi dot into the psi j. This is the uh, overlap times the function psi i over lambda k. And if one of the eigenfunctions is going to 0, then sufficiently close to the instability is going to be only one dominant term. We call it lambda p, the one that goes into 0. And then you now understand that the non-affine response is actually proportional to the eigenfunction of the Hessian that is associated with the eigenvalue that goes to 0. So this is really an interesting understanding that what is the non-affine thing that occurs when you have an instability is really that the motion of the particles under this non-affine response is dominated by the eigenfunction of the Hessian that is associated with zero eigenvalue. So let's look at them. How do they look? Well, it turns out that when you're here at zero strain, all the eigenfunctions are delocalized. So the eigenfunctions are all over the, the space. There's nothing really that characterizes them as, as Interesting. When you go down, when lambda begins to go to zero, there is a fantastic phenomenon of localization. And the eigenfunction that was delocalized there localizes on a structure like this that we've seen today already a couple of times. This is the famous quadrupole that uh, I'm going to associate soon with the national B phenomenon. But it's really a very simple thing. It's the easiest way to locally release stress. Some particles are streaming in, some particles are streaming out, and you have a release of stress uh, that actually um, has to do with the mechanical instability where the system throws away some of its stress, some of its energy, and this is the phenomenon that we call a plastic instability or a fundamental plastic instability. Now, I want to say this is a very general approach. I'm going to discuss tomorrow magnetic glasses. So there you have uh, a situation that the, the system doesn't only depend on the positions, but you have also a position, say, a dependence on spins, for example, and you can look at sort, uh, sort of phenomena like the Barkhäuser noise, and the way to understand it is the same. Let's you say you write now a Hessian matrix is not going to be bigger, it's not going to be only discrete u, dr i, dr j, but there's going to be also a derivative with respect to the angles of spins. So it's going to be a bigger matrix, but it's the same phenomenon in the sense that you're going to have these quadrupolar things together, maybe with spin flips. I'm going to talk about this more tomorrow, because by the way, metallic glasses, when you think about it, are many times are ferromagnetic. So you have interesting interactions between the mechanics and the magnetism, which I'm going to reserve for the lecture tomorrow. Okay, now the nice thing that is almost a miracle, but it's really beautiful, and we are very, um, we all, all of us are very lucky that it happens, is that these quadrupoles that we see in the, in the spontaneous response of our 
glassy materials to external strain are very easy to, to model. And the reason they are very easy to model is because of the great work of Mr. Eshelby that was already mentioned in the 50s. Now, Eshelby solved an entirely different problem. He asked, suppose that I have an elastic medium, let's say in 2D for, for simplicity. Now, let us carve out a little circle from this medium, take it out, squish it and pull it into an ellipse and squeeze it back. What's going to be the elastic response of this system? And that can be exactly solved in elasticity theory. Turns out the same solution is here. So this is really this streaming out and, uh, I mean, pushing in and pushing back, which is, in fact, you can show, you can argue, is the cheapest way to release stress uh, in a system. And this is why these two problems are actually uh, f uh, falling on each other. So here you see a plot that Tratul has actually produced when he was with us um, of a spontaneous uh, non-affine movement of the particles versus an SLB solution. And this is an analytic solution in the sense that I can write the displacement field as a function of distance from a core. So this x as a vector. You, I mean, you don't need to remember all the details here, except that there are two parameters in this problem. The two parameters are the vortex size, the a, which is the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the core size, a, which is the core of the SLB solution, and epsilon star, which is the eigenstrain of this problem, otherwise everything else is in the geometry, and if you plot this, you get this, which by fitting to your n n n numerical things, you know, for your system, you can get a very good approximation to the eigenstrain and the core size. I want to stress these are non-universal. You take a different system, you change the Leonard Jones, you go, I don't know, another uh, situation, you get a different epsilon star and a different A, but the solution is universal. That is to say, this is indeed the cheapest way to release stress. So you have a non-affine eigenfunction with eigenvalue goes to, to zero always, but you only change the two parameters here, epsilon and A. In three dimensions, I'm going to tell you, you get a ellipsoid. But it's very interesting. You see, if you look, if you look at the response to shear, for example, on a three-dimensional thing, and you do the shear this way, there's no forcing in this direction. So the ellipsoid is actually squished, and it's effectively 2D. It's very interesting. I'll show you later. We have looked at this, uh, at the extension of what I'm going to show now to, to 3D, and everything repeats but uh, you have to work a little bit more in order to see this carefully. Yes. One of the things which goes into the solution are the elastic particles for the SLB. The surrounding, you need the elastic particles. Actually, this is now parameterized here by the eigenstrain and the core size. So everything is already in these parameters. New is the Poisson ratio. Yeah, Poisson ratio. The global. Okay, now we go back to the issue of what happens when I strain a system in this way of quasi-static. So I do a small strain, I energy minimize, do a small strain, and energy minimize. As I showed you, you know, and this is, by the way, the energy versus the strain. Usually people plot sigma. So sigma is linear. The energy is, of course, quadratic because the energy goes like sigma times gamma. And if, gamma, and if sigma is linear in gamma, it goes like gamma squared, so you have a sort of a parabolic increase. And people say nothing happens here, like you said, right, Sorajit? That this is a region that is elastic, nothing happens. Well, things do happen, one has to be careful. So if you blow up this region here, whoop, I mean, you'll see this drop. So the plastic instabilities are there. Even in the regime that looks sort of extremely, pla extre extremely elastic, there are already plastic responses, but they're small. They're small in what sense? In a very precise sense. If you do now system size analysis, the stress, the average stress drops in this region are system size independent. So they're really localized. Um, now, localized here is not in the sense that we discussed today that the event, the event has a power load decay, but the amount of stress drop or energy is system size independent. So it's a very precise statement that one can make. 
At some point, when you go to a large gamma, you begin to get large drops. And what has been large? Again, system size dependence. Now you look at these as a function of system size, and they are linear. They are sublinear. They are subextensive in the system size, but they depend on the system size. They go like n number of particles to some exponent, smaller <coughs> than one. And these large events is what I want to understand, because these large events, I'm going to argue, are system spanning. Of course, they have to be system spanning if they grow with uh, the system size. And these are the origin or the clues, if you want, to these uh, interesting instabilities that uh, we started with, the shear bending, even though it's not still, sh still shear bending. Let me make another point that I said personally today to um, Surajit. There's no yield here. This is a strain-controlled experiment in which I strain and energy minimize, strain and energy minimize. I can go up to gamma equals 400. It, it doesn't matter because I strain and energy minimize, strain and energy. So there's no real yield, okay? Actually, real yield to me exists only when I do strain control, and, not, and stress control, and not when I do strain control. Let's say if this is strain control. If I do stress control, I increase the external stress and the system can respond with an internal stress up to a point, and at some point it just cannot respond and it really yields, goes yeah, and sort of disappears. Really, the I mean, quetches. Uh, so I'm not going to call this yield, but I'm going to call this um, an interesting system spanning instability, which is a, if you want, a precursor to the phenomenon of yield that I showed you in the slide before from the experiment. So I want to understand what are these. And in fact, we argue that what are these are actually concatenations of these fundamental SLB instabilities that we talked about before. Now, let me explain this because, I mean, it's very interesting to understand what is the difference between the single one and the chain of those. And of course, I'm going to explain why there's a chain, when can you get a chain, etc. But the point is this. If you have one <coughs> SLB, with particles coming in and particles going out, this solution now decays to infinity. Okay? But now imagine that you can concatenate a number of these. So here is another one. And here is another one. And here is another one. And here is another one. Now this is going out. This is coming in. Okay? This is this is coming in, this is going out. Now I can do a global connection. Okay, so now the solution changes in the sense that now they are globally connected. And what does it mean? It means now that this is streaming this way and this is streaming this way. Fantastic, this is what we wanted. It's a localization of the strain. Okay, so the strain that at the beginning was uh, sort of done in a non-affine way globally, suddenly because of the ability of these objects to concatenate, now suddenly all the strain is organized in such a thin layer. Or all the motion, all the non-affine motion is organized in this uh, a, a thin layer, so this is not a, a, a break. Now why, why can this not appear here? And one, why, can they, a, 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 why can they appear there? Why do I need to go to a certainly large gamma in order to be able to get such a chain? And I'm going to show you there is a critical value of gamma of the order of 7%. <coughs> so what do I need to do? I now need to estimate what is the... <laughs> don't have such a face. I'm going to explain. I mean, you don't need to read it and understand. I'll, I'll explain. So what I need to do, I need to now show you that if I take not a single SLB, but now take a random array of SLBs in my system, okay? A random array. And I'm going now to compute the energy of the array. And then I'm going to minimize it. I'll show you the minimal solution, the minimum is occurring. Ah, by the way, I didn't say they can be in a different phase. Right, if this is going this way, this can go this way, and this can go this way, right? So they can have been rotating with respect to each other, in general. And now I want to take such an array, compute its energy, and minimize it. I'll show you in three steps. The first, the mi mi minimization means that they all have to have the same phase. 
And then if they all have the same phase, the minimum energy is occurring when they're in a line. So when they're aligned in a way that looks like this, okay, that we see here. And aligned with an angle that we're going to understand, an angle that depends on something that we're going to discuss. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yes. And I'll show you that the diminuum is such that for small gamma, there's only one solution of a single Ashleby, and there is a crossover to a gamma where you can have m m multiple. Sorry? The whole medium is disordered. Okay, so now what is the energy, okay? So I know the A should be solution. It gives me the displacement and therefore the stress, therefore the strain, whatever I want is analytically at my hands. So now I can firstly look at the energy of the material that is strained. So this is the sigma alpha beta, the strain infinity and epsilon beta alpha, whether there are Eschelbys or there are no Eschelbys, right? It's a linear theory, right? It's elasticity theory. So I can add up solutions. So this is the background strain, which is independent of where the Eschelbys are. Then I have a interaction between the eigenstrain of the Eschelby and the background strain. Okay, so I have the background strain, I'm sorry, the background stress and the Ashleby strain, and this is the volume over which the Ashleby lives. Then I have the uh, self energy of the Ashleby, which is the energy, which is the Ashleby strain times the Ashleby stress itself, okay, and it and have to be um, multiplied by its volume. And the last thing is the Ashleby Ashleby interaction. So it's the strain of one Ashleby and the stress of the other, where the distance is Rij in between them. Okay, this is all. And now I see, when I look at this, that the only term in which sigma infinity appears is this. Okay, so this is the external stress. Here, the external stress does not appear because it's the self energy of the Ashleby, and this is the Ashleby Ashleby interaction, which is independent of the thing there. So I can say, let me look at sufficiently large sigma, and this I have to minimize first, because sigma infinity can be sufficiently large, so if I want a minimum, let's minimize this first. When I minimize this first, I find that all the Ashleby's have to have the same phase. They say they have to be organized with the same NXI and NYI. So wh wherever they are, they're all in phase. That is to say, if this one is here and the other one is here, then it has to, to look this way, in phase. That is to say the same thing there. And now I'm using this in these terms. So I'm using this in these terms, and then the calculation becomes much simpler. So let me make a step and tell you that I can write now the total energy in a very pleasing way in, as a function of the density of the Ashleby's. Now this is the density of the Ashleby's and gamma is the strain. And I can write it as an energy carrying parameter UP. I have a term that is linear in the density. It goes like one minus gamma over gamma Y. I have a cubic and I have a quintic. Now how does it look? Well, it looks uh, such, uh, 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 firstly, I have to say that this gamma y is not a parameter. It is exactly computable in this theory. And um, gamma y, which I'm going to call the yield, or let us say the critical value when temperature is zero and when the strain rate is zero, is going like the eigenstrain epsilon star over two minus one mu, where this is the Poisson ratio. So this is known, and I can compute it. And now let me show you how this looks. So this looks like this. As a function of the density of the Ashleby's for different gammas. So for small gamma, it looks like this. Okay, for small gamma, it looks like this. Now you want to, to minimize it, there's only one minimum at rho equals zero. This is a single one. Okay, that's the thing. Now you increase gamma, and this becomes flatter and flatter. At some point, you have a crossover. And this occurs, of course, when gamma equals gamma yield. So, uh, okay, so this explains 
Ah, by the way, I of course didn't say that when you also solve this problem, when you solve this problem for a simple shear, this exact simple shear, you find in the minimization that after these objects having the same phase, they also have to be at exactly 45 degrees with respect to the uh, principal axis of the stray. So something is not general here, because uh, we know from the literature that there are also different angles. So where is that? The answer is actually deep and is nice. The answer is that what we considered here is a simple strain which is energy conserving. Energy conserving means that the eigenvalue that describe the streaming out and the eigenvalue that describe the streaming in are exactly opposite of each other. So the sum has to be zero because I'm... Sorry? Volume. 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 Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, really? Area conserving in 2D. Area conserving in 2D, not energy conserving. Area conserving in the sense that the two eigenvalues sum up to zero. So where are the different angles? Well, the, the answer is that when you do uniaxial, when you push in or when you pull out, there's no longer energy, uh, no longer area conservation. And in fact, you can write an exact solution again by minimizing taking into account the eigenvalues of the Ashley here, zeta n and zeta k, we call them, and the general answer is the cosine of the theta of the angle is one half minus the sum. So if zeta n is minus zeta k, you get the one half, which gives you 45 degrees. Otherwise, you could get a different angle. I'm sorry that it's down there, but now when you look at the angle, you find the angle, you realize <coughs> that this angle can be, is limited between zeta n uh, much larger than zeta k, or zeta k much larger than zeta n, when the two limits are 30 degrees and 60 degrees, and this really depends on where you are, and this agrees very well. Okay, so the answer why you can get different angles is because now you are doing a different strain. No longer, a, 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 no longer area a conserving, but with two different eigenvalues, and then when you do this, then the actual value of the energy depends on the angle, and you get a different angle in the minimum. All right, now you asked already before about how to generalize this to three dimensions. Well, you just do it. Yes, second. Okay, so, good question. So, I think what you are re referring to that you didn't put in a question, that sometimes there is shear bending, sometimes there is no shear bending. The answer is in the quench rate. When you quench fast, the system is rather disordered, and then the stress versus strain curve in AQS is going to go sort of continuously into the steady state. Of course, steady state always is independent of anything. Whereas, if you quench slow, this is going to go more like this, and with a, a stress peak, and here we're going to have this instability that we are saying. Now, this will appear in three places, in the Poisson ratio, in epsilon star, and in A. Okay, so the nature, as I sort of showed you, I need at least one ratul to do this, to do this fit. Okay? I mean, we, I mean, I don't know a priori what is epsilon and what is A, and also not what is the Poisson ratio. These are measured objects, and they depend, okay? So that will tell you whether you can reach, in fact, the correct answer is that you need to reach a sufficiently large sigma, stress. And if you go this way, you never get there, okay? So only with well-quenched system, you can go up with a gamma, and a sigma that is sufficiently high so that you get this um, phenomenon. Okay, you asked before about three, yeah, sorry. Points, Lennon Jones points, yeah. They, they, they do, they say the, the choice of the length scale sigma AA, sigma AB, sigma AB also determines the Poisson ratio. Huh? Yeah, also, also on the, the quench rate. 
No, no, but if you change the potential, you, put, you change the Poisson ratio. Also quench rate and all these things. Okay, so as before about uh, 3D. Because, because what <laughs> this one? Because the These are the eigenvalues associated with the HLB solutions, which depend on the nature of the strain. Let's say if you do a simple strain, then the sum of zeta n plus zeta k, the two eigenvalues, is zero. When you do uh, uh, when you do uniaxial, they don't sum up two to zero because it's not uh, area conserving. Or when you uh, pull, it's not area conserving, and then you get different values here, and that will determine the different data, which comes from the solution of this minimization of the energy. It it will give you a different angle depending on these on these zetas. It's not detailed, it's very important, yeah. Uh, this is coming from the SLB calculation. The answer is that when you have uniaxial, the solution for the SLB is no longer a function only of the epsilon star, which is a combination of those. But it now depends on three parameters, zeta n, zeta k, and the Poisson ratio. And that solution now will look different and will respond differently to the far away external strain in choosing a different angle. But this is an analytic uh, calculation of that minimum. Of the SLB solution, yeah, exactly. And you need to fit this. That is to say, you need to look at your single SLB in this medium under, straight, under pulling or under pushing and fit the eigenvalues and the thing in them. And then you use it and you get the right angle. That depends. So say when we looked at the steady state, I mean, you see, then you have large ones and you have small ones. So not each one of these is a, is a uh, sort of sheer uh, sheer concentrating instability. So they're also small guys. They're as small as these ones here. So they are localized ones and some extensive ones. Now this may be a fluke, maybe a fluke of the protocol of a thermal quasi-static because I force the system to go back to equilibrium every time. It's not impossible that if I didn't do this, after this the system would break if I didn't force it to go back. In fact, if I did a stress control, after this it usually will break, it will just go rot. Okay, but I'm interested in the first instability of this type in order to understand the angles and the minimal value of gamma where this can happen. And this we have as numbers. They do, as you see here. So this is the whole system, this is not a, this is not a, a window, that's the whole system. Now, I have to say, by the way, I have to say that in the calculation, okay, when you do this uh, computation of the energy, okay, which I alluded to, we are using a, a far field approximation. They say you don't allow the SLBs to be too close. And for that reason, we have a, a problem in determining the density. So I don't know here where is the minimum. Because I cannot go to those length scale because I cannot use the far field. That's still a problem, and I don't know really how to, to solve it. It's, it's, it's difficult, except by some complicated numerics. Yeah. Here I have a question. Sure. Are you sure that there is only one minimum, or there can be multiple? Difficult question, Sojit. I, I, I don't know. And since I'm using a far field approximation, I can only do this. And I'm happy enough to see a very clear cut transition at a very clear gamma y. Okay, that's, uh, that's what I can do. As I said, I want to say something precise about what I can. Okay, and uh, you know, you cannot do with these methods more than what you can do. Okay, so we talked about different angles. Now, generalization of the dimensions. As I said, an Ashleby circle generalized to an Ashleby sphere, but in fact remains two dimensional for the reasons I said before, that there's no strain in the other direction. Now, a student, uh, Carmel, did a um, truly two-de-force numerics 
to show that the line of Ashleby quadrupoles generalizes to a plane of Ashleby ellipsoids. And the calculation predicts the minimal energy arrangement is for quadrupoles lying on a triangular lattice on localization plane. Let me show you how it looks. So it looks like this. I mean, you have now a three-dimensional system, and now you're strained this way. You're strained this way, and now your Ashleby's are organized on planes, and this is now the numerical um, uh, computation from a numerical simulations, and it shows that the way that they are sitting when you look at this plane here shh, is like this on a triangular lattice, and this triangular um, lattice is predicted from the analytic calculation of the uh, three-dimensional problem with all the Ashleby's in 3D, etc., which is much more difficult, but still doable by hand, and the numerics seems to support the uh, existence of such a thing, and of course, this now is going to have a sheer plane or a concentration of the, of the uh, instability on the plane. Uh, these are now going to be globally connected this way, so the flow is going to be this way, and here, this way, this here, right? so everywhere it's going to be organized on a sheer plane, and this is the generalization to 3D. You can compute the, the critical gamma, you can compute the angles, it's just a little bit more complex. Let me finish by saying something about dependence on temperature. And to that aim, I want to refer you to a phenological law that was found by Bill Johnson and Conrad Zammer. Conrad Zammer is my colleague in Göttingen, and as I said, Bill Johnson is the, uh, the sort of uh, cooker of metallic glasses in Caltech, he has some 40 postdocs that are cooking every morning 10 different glasses. No, it's, it's quite amazing to, to go and see this. You know, CERN is nothing compared to Bill Johnson. <laughs> anyway, so, so what these guys have found in careful experiments, that if they know the yield where the shear bending or the yield occurs at temperatures zero, with zero strain rate, then there is an interesting law that tells them the yield uh, point gamma yield as a function of temperature and gamma dot. This is just from doing experiments, a different temperature and different gamma dot, where this is this value that we just discussed, times one minus unknown coefficient, times the temperature, times a very funny function, logarithm to the two thirds of a typical frequency that we don't know where it's coming from, another parameter they don't know where it's coming from, and gamma dot. So in their stuff, they fitted this with three unknown parameters, A, omega naught, and C. I mean, gamma dot, this is simply a frequency in order to allow you to take a logarithm with a gamma dot, which is one over time. And the question is, can you actually understand this? Can you derive such a law? Now, the point is that each one of you could do it. This is really an easy calculation. It's really one day. Because now we have an energy with a maximum. So at temperature zero, you're stuck here. You can go. But at temperature finite, you can escape. So it's really the calculation of an escape over a barrier. It's very easy to do. Everybody can do it in three hours. And in fact, uh, when you do it, what you find, so so, in fact, uh, well, this is just a, re a remark. So, for finite strain rate, a transition can occur only when uh, the escape time tau times gamma dot is of the order of one. Because if gamma dot is faster, then you don't have the time to escape, etc. So, this is the condition, and now you have to compute the escape over a barrier tau as a function of temperature when you're given that energy barrier that I gave you there, which is analytically written. And when you do this, you just get the, uh, I mean, you get a law that is exactly the law of uh, somewhere and Johnson, except that now we know all the coefficients. So this is a comparison between uh, the numerically found now a different temperature, this now numerical simulations, a different temperature and gamma dot. This was done by Ashwin J. And in fact, uh, there is no free parameter here. Everything here is computable from the theory. So, I mean, you have a very good fit between the theory and the experiment, and you understand roughly where this uh, Johnson 
uh, Zamwer law is coming from. Uh, and I think that's all that I want to say. Thank you very much. How do you? And that should be. Well, you just see it. It looks like this. I mean, when you do the, the instability, right, when you change your strain, at some point, at some gamma p, you, you see this. Okay? Now, here, I'm sorry, here, you can actually measure how the displacement falls off from a center. Okay? So this has to fit the analytic solution of HLB. And of course, you have two parameters, which is the core size, which is you know, difficult to say, but you, you just fit it, and the, um, the strain, epsilon star. So ask Ratul how he does it. You know, he fits two parameters to this function, and you get the, the thing. Now, from that point on, you don't touch it. This is what you use in the calculation. Okay, and for example, for the case that you have a uniaxial thing, you get a somewhat different picture where the rate of uh, decay of the particles coming inside is a function of length and the rate of decay of those going outside is going to be different. So this will determine two eigenvalues, zeta and zeta k, rather than a single epsilon star. And then you use that in the calculation, you get a different angle. This is from the displacement. This is the, this is the actual response of the system when you have a plastic instability. This is the eigenmode. It's the same. The, the actual response, as I showed you, when, you are, when lambda is very small, when you're very close to the instability, then the non-affine displacement and the eigenfunctions, the eigenfunctions are actually the same object. So the, the non-affine response is determined by the eigenfunction. So you can, you can compute either. Either you take the Hessian and compute the, the critical eigenfunction to fit it to the SUB, or you look at the numerical simulation and, uh, and you fit it to the analytic solution that you have. Okay, so here's the analytic solution, you have to fit them, and here's a typical fit that Ratul has uh, provided. What is it in the structure that tells you that... Uh, Woo! <laughs> Now you're coming back to the discussion I had now for seven years with Jim Langer. You know, I have to say that I started to work on all these things together with Jim Langer, and we were very good friends. And then for seven years, he doesn't talk to me. And the reason he doesn't talk to me is because he had this STZ theory that he said, well, there are shear transformation zones in the system. And I told him, Jim, I want to do numerical experiments. How do I measure these STZs? He says, well, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? So what are they? Well, they are there. So how do I measure them? Don't know. And then I started to be suspicious. Now, I admire Jim Langer. He's, he's, he's a great guy, a great physicist, and we used to be great friends. Um, but they are not there. Now, what are they? I tried to explain. They are protocol dependent. You see, you now you strain the system, either by simple shear or by uniaxial. What will happen depends. It's not something that is there that suddenly jumps and says, I'm here. You do a protocol. The protocol has reversible non-affine transformations. The system changes at the protocol, okay? When you go to any of these lines, let's see, where was it? Uh, I think here, no. Yeah, so you go here, okay? You go here. This is already a drop, it's irreversible, but Every little step in delta gamma, there is a reversible non-affine transformation. After every delta gamma, you energy minimize. Delta gamma, energy minimize. You have a UI all the time. System is changing. There is no way in the world that you can look at the system here at gamma equals zero and tell me where it's going to happen. Absolutely no way. Because the system changes on you. Just before the jump, it's very easy. Because you look at the eigenfunction, 
And the one with the lambda going to, to zero will tell you where it is. So you can say, yes, I mean, it's going to happen, it's going to happen here. Close to the instability, the leading eigenfunction will tell you where it's going to happen. Ah, that's but that's already, you know. That's global. Locally, can I say anything about it? What do you mean locally? I mean, did you get it? This is displacement. Well, I mean, before the displacement, they can already compute the eigenfunction. It's going to tell me what the displacement is going to be when lambda hits zero. But they have to be, of course, sufficiently close. Just by looking at the positions of the particles near that region, can I say? The positions, of, I mean, where it's going to happen is, being, is determined by the eigenfunction, which you can compute before the events, but close enough to the event. You know, if you go sufficiently far, the eigenfunction is delocalized. By the way, it's a very interesting thing, and I want to make a point here. You see, we have a random medium here. It's a, it's a disordered system. Everybody knows about Anderson localization in random media. But Anderson localization, what we discussed before also, is the localized eigenfunctions are high energy functions. There's no localization, the low energy. Here it's the opposite. It's a different kind of localization transition. Very interesting. It occurs with the lowest eigenvalues or the, eigen, or the lowest energy. So it's a different kind of localization that is occurring. Um, and it's, uh, I cannot say, even though we discussed it in say a few words, I don't have a full understanding of the difference. Do you want to say something about this, uh, Sarojit? Yeah, we discussed it with, with Deepak. Deepak, you want to explain what's the difference? Wait, wait, take the, take the speaker. The localization occurs near the band edges, so it can be the left edge or the right edge. Yeah, but why one edge in one case and the other edge in another case? Can you explain? Some local change in the randomness at some point, let's say. And that will be very localized and very high energy, I guess. Okay. And here, a... a So it's a softening, it's a softening, it's a softening in the sense that a spring constant, so to speak, goes to zero, so the energy goes to zero. Whereas there, it's not a softening, but actually it's a speeding up, right? Because something becomes sort of rattling. Okay, to zero to the approximation. But it's, it's really a different phenomenon, and it's, I think it's very interesting. The gamma p, yes, but, but not where in the, not, not physically. In your strain Of course, of course. There's no question. Is it because the end that STZs don't exist? They have no meaning. They have no meaning. That is to say, in the, let me be very precise. Because Peter Shawal experiment, he does call them. He sees events. Now, the, the question should be stated precisely, so the answer is precise. Okay, let me state the question precisely. Given a stressless, strainless system, can you predict, if they say make shear, where the plastic instabilities are going to occur, where the STZs are going to show up? I say no. And I say the reason is because it's not only uh, structure dependent, it's also protocol dependent. You see, you do a protocol, you, you do shear, or you do uniaxial. The system is changing on you. There is a series of increases and non-affine reversible. You can go back as long as it's not before you reach the first, the first uh, thing here, which, by the way, in the thermodynamic limit is very close. But I'm sorry. Before you reached this point here, okay? So in this region, which is now blown up here, in this region here, there is no instability. Nevertheless, there are a series, a large series of non-affine reversible transformations. 
which doesn't mean that if I stop here and go back, I'll not go to, to the same state that I started with. Once I have an instability, I go back, I'll go to a different state. Okay, it's irreversible. But now the system is changing. And in a way, that depends on your protocol. Whether you're doing shear or doing uniaxial, it's going to change in a different way. So where it's going to respond depends on the protocol, not only on the structure. So structure determine as disease do not exist. Okay? That's the statement I'm making. And because of this, Jim is not talking to me for seven years. Yes. But that's another problem. Yeah, so, um, no, there, there's, you, you've said a few things about SDZs and, and, and uh, okay. what different Which people agree. think about it. Uh, yes and no. So let me ask the question okay. that I want to ask. Uh, so one way of, I'm, I'm going to ask it in two, three different ways, okay. Uh, one, one way of asking is why aren't the HLB inclusions that are central to your description of what goes on not SDZs? Okay. Um, this is and, what and, I just and, and explained. This is what I just explained. They're not, well, they're not structure determined. No, but that, that is not a necessary they don't exist of necessarily. They don't exist necessarily in the unstrained system. You say you strain the system, you have a protocol. Some region is becoming sensitive. Okay? It wasn't there, maybe, or right. it wasn't that, or wasn't in that region, or maybe not in that form when the system was not unstrained. No, but I mean, is there so a the, but it, it's a deep, subtle, but deep difference between a theory that is based on... The, see, what I think is Jim, who is a great scientist, followed the ideology of Ali Argon and Spapen. And they, I know this from discussion with Ali, who is also a great scientist. They were trying to generalize the dislocation picture of a crystal. Now, dislocation exists. It's there. More and, they're the trying, and they're trying to right. pretend hmm. that in the amorphous solid, also there are things there, like the dislocations. Then to be beautiful, right? Then I know it's there, and they're going to do something, they're going to move, they're going to do plastic thing. It doesn't exist. The system is responding to the yeah. protocol that you're following. And that's a different way of thinking no, that is subtle, but is, I think is important. Sure, but, but uh, I want to insist that in, in whatever version of SDC theory you look at, there is no pretense made of these things as being sort of conserved uh, entities that I, are already present, they're I, created there is, and no, destroyed. I think there is. Right? I think there is. There is well, a notion of the density of them, and there is a notion yeah, but, of the but, probability of no, I mean, it's... They, they pop in and out, so... In that sense, uh, okay. I, I think there is no fundamental, in my view. I agree that you're right? sufficiently vague, then everything is okay. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> go, go ahead, Sergeant. The room is there, and all of us can continue discussing. On this point, suppose I went to the thinker of this theory, at the phase diagram in this chemical potential and strain space. So what do you think will happen? I don't know how you put a chemical potential on these things. They're not at your disposal. They appear where they should appear. How would you force, I mean, how can you put a, how do you control them? There are spontaneous instabilities. So in, a, in a Monte Carlo simulation, one can. Hmm. You can. How? You they can will appear when they should. the Hamiltonian and then go into an ensemble where once in a while you. Uh, Changing the Hamilton is going to make wild changes in where, sure, where these sure, things are. Course, yeah, yeah, but you don't control. You don't know. So they're going to appear elsewhere. They're going to be look different. Yeah. What are you going to do? What can you say substantial? Uh, I, I frankly don't know. Maybe you know. I don't know what you want to achieve, what do you want to say. So uh, I would have thought that there would be a similar transition as you change the chemical potential without changing strain at, at a fixed strain. So. I'm not sure. 
a bit, you know, things are very yeah. delicately protocol dependent. I showed you even the angle of the shear band depends on whether you preserve the area upon your uh, straining or don't. It can be huge changes from 30 degrees to 60 degrees. It's very delicate. You know, everything depends very finely on the external strain process. And the process, not just the value. Whether you got to that strain this way or that way, etc. Okay, so I think we continue the discussion just quickly. If there's anyone in the other seminar room who has a question, you have to run here within the next five seconds. If not, let's thank Kitama for uh, the question. <laughs> 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 I just <laughs> 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 <laughs>